All right, welcome. This is continuity and discontinuity. What's the difference going to be between present life on earth, which we're familiar with, most of us, and future life on the new earth? There's going to be a lot that we're going to cover in here, so I've crammed a lot into PowerPoint slides and we're going to move pretty rapidly. Originally, when I was told this was going to be a workshop, I thought, great, everybody introduce yourself, say where you're from, say something about your family. Does not quite work with this many people. Probably those of you in the back, I'm imagining some of you will want to move forward. Uh, some of the slides uh, have smaller font than, than others. Um, that link, website link is there so that you can see uh, the whole PowerPoint presentation will be there. No need to take notes. You can get it there. You can get links to videos, articles, um, my favorite books on uh, new heavens and new earth, on the subject of uh, heaven, and uh, all of the theologians I will quote from in this presentation, any work I quote from will be accessible to you there. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your love and your grace. We give ourselves to you. We pray that you would be honored and glorified in this time together and that our hearts and our minds could be moved to understand what you have revealed to us in your word, which is such a great salvation and a redemptive plan that is far bigger than many believers in Christ have ever imagine. We pray that you would stir our hearts and imaginations and minds in Jesus' name. Amen. So, disclaimer. First, I've not actually been to heaven. And you know, there was a time when that went without saying. That's no longer the case. Uh, we actually had somebody call our ministry uh, television program. They wanted to do, uh, you know, a special on heaven. And they asked uh, one of our staff members, uh, so this is Randy Alcorn ministry, and he, he's written a best-selling book on heaven, right? And she says, yes. And, and they go on and talk, and then they're trying to set everything up, and then they clarify. Now, Randy has actually been to heaven, correct? And so, well, no, as far as I know, if he has, he's never mentioned it. Um, and uh, so they said, oh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, we really need somebody that's been there. And so that was the end of that discussion. So just in case somebody needs to leave and go to another uh, workshop, however, at the Gospel Coalition, I'm thinking your chances are pretty slim of uh, finding someone in the other workshops that's uh, been to heaven as well. So the most important aspect of heaven is we shall see God. We will relate to Him forever. We will see Him as He is. What a glorious thing, though not the subject of this workshop. <laughs> Not because it's not worthy, it's the most worthy, but of course, others at other times are talking about this, and this one is on, on the subject of continuity. There's insufficient time to fulfill the workshop description. I read that through when I sit there and say, who is the idiot who wrote this? And then I realized it was me. There's no possible way we can get this all in in an hour, or so I'm just going to do my best, uh, and I hope some of the practical applications will be somewhat evident as our hearts are stirred uh, and our minds are challenged. Uh, again, that website includes the PowerPoint videos, articles, um, authors and books, all of that. All right, Isaac Asimov, very well-known unbeliever who wrote so many science fiction novels, many of which I enjoyed, though his worldview did tend to come out uh, sometimes, but still uh, fanciful, entertaining. Tragically, Isaac Asimov wrote, I don't believe in an afterlife, so I don't have to spend my whole life fearing hell or fearing heaven even more. Like if you don't believe something, well then, okay, now you're free. But unfortunately or fortunately, our beliefs don't determine reality as uh, I'm afraid Isaac Asimov now knows. But what he says is, for whatever the tortures of hell, I think the boredom of heaven would be even worse. That is the stereotypical view of heaven out in our culture. Now, let me follow with this, and when you find out who said it, it's going to take on another dimension. 
though this is a very common view. Whenever I think about heaven, it makes me depressed. I'd rather cease to exist when I die. I can't stand the thought of endless, boring tedium. To me, heaven doesn't sound much better than hell. I'd rather be annihilated than spend eternity like that. These words were spoken to me by an evangelical pastor. Now, the question that I would ask is, how could a man who loved God very genuinely and who studied the Word and was a graduate of Bible college and seminary, how could he have this view of heaven? But it's not restricted to him. I had a youth pastor's wife write me about one of my novels, uh, my novel Deadline, and said, this is the first time I have ever heard about heaven in a way that didn't scare me about the idea of going there. She says, I grew up in a Christian family, went to a Christian school where we were taught that when we got to heaven, we wouldn't remember this life, we wouldn't remember the people that we knew, it would be all brand new, and there would be no connection between our life here and our life there, and the idea absolutely terrified me. Well, what does Scripture say? Revelation 22, 3 through 5, I, I'm usually, when I don't say what the version is, it's the ESV, only appropriate at the Gospel Coalition, and it's what I usually use, but sometimes the NIV, I think, gets it right on the money, and this is one of those, no longer will there be any curse. God's servants, it's talking about in context, will serve Him. What do servants do? That they always have things to do, places to go, people to see. There's no boredom in the life of the servant. And to be delivered from the curse? Boredom is part of the curse. We'll be delivered from… Th- we'll look back at this life and go, boy, that could get boring sometimes, but never again. In the ages to come, Ephesians 2, 7 says, God will be re- re- revealing to us the riches of His grace and His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. We will learn throughout eternity. When we die, we'll remain finite, you know. Every once in a while I hear somebody say, well, of course, once we die and we're with the Lord, we'll know everything. No, only God knows everything. We will be learning and growing in our knowledge of God. They will see His face. What could be better than that? And if you think that heaven will be boring and heaven is being with God, then this reveals that you actually think an attribute of God is boring. It's not. He's the most exciting being by far in the universe. He invented excitement. Sure, as we've made it a building things, he created animals which are so fascinating. And God's people will reign forever and ever. Where will we reign? Up in some disembodied state, up where the angels are, where we'll drift around. Now, there's just nothing to rule. I mean, how do you rule? Well, guess what? God's plan in Genesis 2, I will create man, mankind in my image, and they together, man and woman, will rule the earth rule the earth to God's glory. That was his original plan. And do you know that many evangelical Christians, and I'm tempted to say most, actually believe that God's original plan got foiled, derailed, and will never be fulfilled so that though he created the world to be managed and led and ruled benevolently, By human beings, only two human beings ever will have experienced that, Adam and Eve, and them apparently for a very short time. And then Satan came in, and Satan apparently got the victory over God because now God has to resign himself to snatching souls out of this world and taking them to the angelic realm forever. That is not what the Bible teaches, not even close. God did not give up on his original plan for us to rule the earth any more than He gave up on us, and He didn't give up on the earth either. The biblical view of redemption is not just individual and personal, it is cosmic in nature. 
This is not universalism, that every person will be saved. Some will be in hell forever. Sadly, I believe that is what the Bible teaches. I'm, I shouldn't say it that way. Sadly, I th- I mean, what the Bible teaches is right and good and just. But what I mean is it is sad for people to be separated forever from Him. No believer who understands what Scripture actually says about eternal life will ever see it as dull or boring or dreadful. No way. Which means, by the way, and we have many pastors, elders, church leaders, women's group leaders, all that are here, we've got to teach. We have got to teach a biblical view of the breadth of redemption that includes life on the new earth and reigning over the new earth for eternity. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, heavens and the earth in the Hebrew and their equivalent words uh, in the Greek speak of the universe. So, another, a, a, paraf- a good paraphrase of Genesis 1-1 would be, in the beginning, God created the universe. It consists of the heavens and the earth. It's not just heaven, a location where God dwells, but the heavens, the celestial heavens, the stars, the planets, the galaxies, the quasars, the black holes, the neutron stars, the nebulae, all of that in His universe. He's the Creator. But then we're told in Isaiah 65, in the midst of a a terrible situation of dominance and exploitation and fear and dread that they were experiencing, God says, behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. I will remake the universe. And some people just are so narrow in their understanding of this. They look at this passage as if it's just talking about God has a plan for the nation Israel. Well, yes, He does. But God has a plan for the people of God, but it's not limited to that. Because He didn't just say, I will create redeemed people. It's, I will create new heavens and a new earth. Isaiah 66, 22 also refers to the new heavens and the new earth. In keeping with His promise, we are looking forward. Here's 2 Peter 3.13. And ask yourself this question. Are you looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth? See, do do you notice that Peter takes for granted? Of course, all Christians are daily, all the time, looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. This earth will be redeemed, and it will be the home of righteousness, and God will remove the sin, the curse, the cause for weeping. It will be gone, and we will reign over a new earth to the glory of God forever. And that's what the people of God, in the midst of persecution, they said, things aren't going well for us on this earth. But you know what? They didn't need bucket lists to say, you know, gee, I wish my, wife, my life had gone better, you know, and because you only go around once, this is our one time on this earth. No, according to the Bible, you actually on earth go around twice and the second time will last forever. It's resurrected life on a resurrected earth. Revelation 21.1, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And a lot of people look at it and say, yeah, they've passed away. It's just like 2 Peter 3. It's the, the, the elements have been dissolved. No trace of the old earth. It is gone forever. But use the logic with that. We are told we will have new bodies. But our new bodies will be what? Our old bodies resurrected, becoming new bodies. So likewise, the earth will be destroyed. Sure, just like people who lived 5,000 years ago, their bodies are destroyed. They're part of the ecosystem. Well, they're gone for good. Oh, no, God can reconstruct and will reconstruct in the resurrection, whether He uses DNA or just does whatever God does. You know, He doesn't have to have a way to do it. He's God. He just does it. And for 
ever we will live in such a redeemed universe, and that's the promise of God. Now, Anthony Hokema's book, The Bible and the Future, I highly recommend this book. Anthony Hokema is an example of an amillennial theologian. I am historic premillennial, as, as John Piper alluded to. That's what he is. Wayne Grudem is that. Many people here uh, are amillennial. Uh, if you, by the way, think that the premill position is just stupid, or you think the amill position is just stupid, it's because you don't understand them. I have read and understand both of them, and both of them make a lot of sense. But ultimately, we have to choose. And, and this is what I think is true. But what I love is that it doesn't matter what we believe about a thousand-year reign of Christ and His people on earth. I won't say it doesn't matter, it is some, but it doesn't matter a great deal compared to a belief that all premillennial and amillennial people should share, and I suppose postmillennial people as well, and that is that forever forever. We will live on a new earth. So we're agreeing on the ultimate eschatology unless we spiritualize it. And we do what I call in my heaven book, uh, Christ Christoplatonism, which is kind of a, a Christianized form of Platonism that says, no, the world, the flesh, the body, it's all bad. And then ultimately we'll just be in a spirit world not the teaching of Scripture, though some of the church fathers, unfortunately, were influenced that way. So going on, what Hokema says, uh, going back, in 2 Peter 3.13 and Revelation 21.1, the word used to designate the newness of the new cosmos is not neos, but kainos. Neos means new in time or origin. Kainos means new in nature or quality. The new earth is not God creating something ex nihilo, out of nothing. It is God taking the old and making it new. We'll talk a little bit more about that. He says, so it's not the emergence of a cosmos totally other than the present one, but a universe which, though gloriously renewed, stands in continuity with the present one. So, should we call the new earth heaven? I'm glad you asked that question. N.T. Wright, in his book, Surprised by Hope, says no. How many of you have read that book by N.T. Wright? Okay, some of you have. He says, no, we shouldn't call it that. In fact, he, he says something very nice about my heaven book, and he uh, sent me a few emails related uh, to it. Uh, when he was doing his background research, my book had come out about three years earlier. And uh, then he actually says in his book uh, that Randy Alcorn has a biblical and robust view of heaven, and then he says, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, of the new earth, and then he says uh, some of the effect of which is surprising for someone from his background. Uh, so it's a little bit of a backhanded compliment, but that's okay. Uh, I'll take it, that compliment. But, but nonetheless, the, but then what he goes on to say is the one area where he takes issue with my book is that the title of the book is Heaven, but predominantly I'm talking about the new earth. And he says you should not call the new earth heaven because heaven will be replaced by the new earth using expressions like heaven is not our home. I do like this statement. Heaven is important, but it's not the end of the world, um, which is one way to put it. Okay, so what and where is heaven so we can resolve this issue, at least in my mind? First, heaven is the triune God's special central dwelling place where He lives with angels and His redeemed people. Secondly, it is that place where God's throne is. It's both of those. The location from which He rules the universe and carries out His sovereign plan. So, there is a present heaven and there is a future heaven in, in my thinking. Two different time frames. You go to heaven immediately when you die, but it's not one at a time resurrection. When, when people talk about, when, when people die, and I've heard people say, and he's up there now in his resurrection body and all, no, that, the resurrection doesn't happen until point of time in the future. So it is apparently a disembodied state, though 
as I deal with in my books on heaven, many times people in the present heaven are depicted in very physical ways, in, including there's a tree, the tree of life is there, relocated apparently from the Garden of Eden, and a people carrying palm branches and wearing uh, robes and speaking, talking, uh, kneeling, doing things that imply some kind of physicality. But clearly, they don't have a resurrection body yet. Eventually, we will. So two different conditions, pre- and post-resurrection, two different locations. The present heaven is called up. It's likely outside of our space-time experience. Uh, I shouldn't say space-time experience. I'll just say in another dimension. It, it, but it's like, I use the analogy of it's like a layover. Um, so we flew here to Orlando uh, from Portland, Oregon with our friends, the Keels. And so we stopped for a layover in Houston. But if anybody was asking us, oh, you're headed off somewhere, where are you going? Would we say Houston or would we say Orlando? Well, normally, you'd say Orlando. Now, I will grant you the present heaven is a great layover. Okay, so I'd rather depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I, I'm torn between the two. The desire to be with Christ, I mean, you know, that all happens at death. We're with the Lord. So it's wonderful, but it's temporary. It's not our final destination. So both the present heaven and the future heaven are really heaven. Now, Revelation 21, 2 and 3 says, God's future special dwelling place will be with His people on the new earth. John says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Coming down where? To the new earth. I don't buy this idea that some have a, well, it doesn't actually arrive on the new earth. It kind of hovers over it. No, I think it's very clear. It's coming down to the new earth. And so here we're told this by God. Now, is there any mistaking what this passage is saying? The dwelling place of God is with man. That's as of the new earth. He will dwell with them, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Do you think God is going to come down and be with us on the new earth? Well, I don't know what else we could have asked him to say than what he said. He's going to be with us. So, it's, it's Emmanuel, God with us forever. You know, Jesus' incarnation did not end after his death or resurrection or ascension. He will be the incarnate, the, the second member of the triune God will be incarnate forever, and we will dwell with him. The throne of God and of the Lamb, somehow the Father is described as having this throne, and of the Lamb will be on the new earth, and we're taught this. So, the new earth will be God's central dwelling place where He'll live with His people and where His throne will be located, and that's why if we understand that, yes, it, the new earth will be different from the present pre-resurrection heaven, and it will be a fully embodied existence, then it's right to call the new earth heaven, to call it the future heaven. So, this is an issue that uh, N.T. Wright has that I respectfully disagree with, even though I think the vast majority of uh, his book on he heaven and the new earth uh, is accurate. So the new earth is where we will forever have life after life after death. So not just life after death where a lot of people think, okay, grandma dies, she loves Jesus, she goes home to be with the Lord, and that's the home that the carpenter from Nazareth promised to build for us. Uh, in my father's house are many rooms, dwelling places. I go to prepare a place for you, and that's where we'll live forever up there with the angels. But that's not the teaching of Scripture. And you see that Scripture is so much broader than this. Ephesians 1, 9, and 10, it talks about uh, the mystery of God's will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven 
and things on earth. Colossians 1.20, through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. Again, heaven and earth brought together, making peace by the blood of his cross. I'm not going to read all of this from Colossians 1. I was kind of setting it in context, but for purposes of time, I would just emphasize how many times do you see the term all things, all things in heaven and created on earth, visible and visible, created by him, all things, all things hold together to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth and heaven. All things in the original Greek, I'll bet you know what it means. It means all things, which is why all the translators translate it that way. So Wayne Grudem in his systematic theology, do a lot of you use Grudem? Raise your hand if you've used, yes, a lot of you do, good. If you don't, it's in the bookstore, get it. And then the smaller edition of that Bible doctrine, also excellent abridgment. Christians often talk about living with God in heaven forever, but the fact that But in fact, the biblical teaching is richer than that. It tells us that there will be new heavens and a new earth, an entirely renewed creation, and we will live with God there. There will also be a new kind of unification of heaven and earth. There will be a new joining of heaven and earth in this new creation. What's the biblical basis of that? We just saw it. It's specifically stated in Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1. Think about the most commonly prayed prayer in all human history. Don't you think the Lord's Prayer probably qualifies as that? So what have God's people prayed more than anything else they've ever prayed? Your kingdom come, your will be done up there where the angels dwell, on earth as it is in heaven. Got a question for you. Do you think God is going to answer that prayer forever? The Bible clearly teaches He will. Habakkuk says, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. Hokema says, the new earth will also be heaven since God will dwell there with his people. Glorified believers, in other words, will continue to be in heaven while they inhabit the new earth. Albert Walters, another book. This is a small book that I highly recommend. If you're not going to read something as big as my big heaven book, read something small like this, Creation Regained. He says, redemption in Jesus Christ reaches us reaches just as far as the fall. The horizon of creation is at the same time the horizon of sin and salvation. Walter says, to conceive of either the fall or Christ's deliverance as encompassing anything less than the whole of creation is to compromise the biblical teaching of the radical nature of the fall and the cosmic scope of redemption. Can I just say we need to teach this to our children. We need to preach this message because this worldview is the greatest worldview there has ever been, and it also happens to be true. You compare it to other worldviews, and there's, there's nothing like it. It's dramatically better than everything else. And it's so ironic that in an age where many Christians compromise uh, their, uh, their view of Scripture in order to say something that's appealing to the world. And here we have the most unbelievably appealing doctrine of a renewed earth, a renewed creation renewed culture and all the things that are part of the doctrine of the new earth, and we haven't been teaching it. And when I say we, I mean most churches are not getting this message out. Most children growing up in Christian homes do not understand this. So when people are tempted to compromise what the Bible says to say something that sounds more appealing, we're sitting on something that's more appealing, and we're portraying heaven as this place where where little cherub, angel babies, 
you know, shoot arrows on Valentine's Day. And, you know, I mean, but it's just, come on. That is not a biblical view of heaven. No child wants to grow up to be a ghost any more than they, you're never going to, in the same way that we will never develop an appetite for gravel, we will never develop an appetite for, wow, drifting around, playing harps. Well, first of all, if you're disembodied, I don't know how you play a harp, but playing harps would be just, and doing nothing else would be, oh, so much fun for maybe 100,000 years. But wouldn't it start to get old? Well, the Bible does not teach that that's what we're going to do. Isaac Watts was not only a great hymn writer, but a great theologian. Uh, And he wrote in this very familiar Christmas hymn, No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, fill it in, far as the curse is found. How far does God's redemptive plan go? As far as the curse is found. How far is the curse found? As far as we know, everywhere in the created universe. Uh, uh, His book on heaven called The World to Come. Highly recommend that book. You got to sift through some of the language, of course, but it's it's amazing. You can you can find it online. So N.T. Wright says, the early Christians believed that God was going to do for the whole cosmos what he had done for Jesus at Easter. Isn't that a great holistic view? What happened with Jesus is not only a picture of our resurrection, it's a picture, it's the first fruits, it's the promise, it's the indicator of what he is going to do with the entire universe. So, blessed, Jesus said, are the meek. And yes, that word makarios really does mean happy. Look it up in the lexicons. Happy are the meek, for they shall inherit what? A disembodied state in heaven? No, the meek are going to inherit the earth. Wow. There's a BC comic where the one guy is reading the Bible. He says, oh, my goodness. The other guy says, what? The Bible says, one day the earth will be destroyed. And the other guy says, do the meek know this? <laughs> it's a good question. What is this promise? Is this a meaningless promise? Well, the meek will inherit the earth, but you're, you're never going to see it. Or at most, you'll see it for a thousand years that doesn't end well. I do believe in a literal millennial kingdom, but I'll tell you the big fault with people who hold the premillennial position like I do is that they look at all the new earth passages and they just turn them into millennial passages. Now we're done with the new earth. That is the wrong approach. So we're told in Daniel 7, he, the Son of Man, Messiah, was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And read it in context. Daniel 7 is talking about kingdoms on earth. He's talking about these four dominant kingdoms on earth, And then he says they're going to be replaced by one where the Son of Man rules the earth forever and people of every nation, tribe, and language worship him. Sound familiar? Like Revelation 5 and 7. And then we're told this in Daniel 7, 18. But the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom, the kingdom that replaces on earth those earthly kingdoms, and will possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. Did we get, uh, is, is there an extra word in there or a couple of extra words? Well, I like the way the NIV translates it here. They will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. And it's almost like God was anticipating a time where people would think, well, I mean, maybe for just a thousand years but certainly no more than that because 
then it will be no more kingdom on earth. You could not have a more emphatic declaration repeated several times in Daniel 7 that God's kingdom on earth will last forever. But the court of God will sit and his, this, this evil earthly leader, perhaps antichrist power, will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. And then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole earth will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. Leadership will be handed over to us. We're part of the family of God. You know what the family business is? It's ruling over creation, ruling over God's creation. He has delegated authority to us to rule the earth. His kingdom, as if we haven't been told enough, will be an everlasting kingdom. And the word translated everlasting, you know what that means. It's everlasting. And all rulers will worship and obey Him. There will be human rulers in this everlasting kingdom. God will rule over all. He's the King of Kings. Capital K, King, lowercase k, King, the King over Kings. George Eldon Ladd in his Theology of the New Testament said, everything in the Gospels points to the idea that life in the kingdom of God in the age to come will be life on the earth, life transformed by the kingdom of God. Martin Lloyd-Jones, great doctrines of the Bible. A lot of you love Martin Lloyd-Jones. Some of you saw the, the movie last night. Everything will be glorified, even nature itself. And that seems to me to be the biblical teaching about the eternal state, that what we call heaven is life in this perfect world as God intended humanity to live it. Men and women are meant to live in the body and will live in a glorified body, in a glorified world, and God will be with them. So when you're talking with your children, or those of us who are older and have grandchildren like Nancy and I do, um, Let's give them this vision of a glorified earth. When they're going down a water slide, don't teach them that, well, of course, you know, one day you won't have a body. Uh, I mean, uh, in eternity, you won't have a body, and there won't be water, and so there won't be water slides, and you won't have fun, but we'll be worshiping God day and night, so look forward to it. <laughs> yeah, but see, here's the thing. We will be worshiping God all the time as we do the water slide thing. You know, God, who we're told in Romans 1 that we're, God has manifested His attributes and His creation. Have you ever watched otters play? Okay, this is what they do all day. They play and eat, and God created them. Now, I know there are some people who play and eat, and that's all they do all day, but that's a different story. But, but my point is, God values those things. Psalm 104, I was reading the other day, Leviathan, the great monster of the deep, who God says he created to play, to play in the ocean that teems with creatures. Men and women are meant to live in the body and live a glorified life in a glorified world. Anthony Buzzard in his book, uh, Our Fathers Who Aren't in Heaven. Now, I disagree with some of his theology. Um, uh, he believes in, in soul sleep, for instance, but he's right in much of what he says about the new earth. Christianity must yet triumph in a renovated earth and with the returned Messiah as universal king or fail, because that's how integral it is to the promise of the gospel. There is no third alternative. So you see in Luke 19, the promise you shall have authority over 10 cities. You are to be over five cities. And a lot of people just say, well, uh, uh, we take that figuratively, but of course there won't be cities in heaven. Well, we know there'll be the New Jerusalem, for sure. So there'll be at least one city. We also know that the gates of the New Jerusalem will be entered into from the kings of the nations of the earth, we're told at the end of Revelation 21. 
Hogamah says, God will make the new earth his dwelling place. Heaven and earth will then no longer be separated as they are now, but they will be one. And he says this, to leave the new earth out of consideration when we think of the final state of believers is greatly to impoverish biblical teaching about the life to come. So, continuity. Job says, I just, I'm always amazed when people say, of course, there's no reference to resurrection in the Old Testament. Okay? After my skin has been destroyed. We're not talking about a bad skin condition here. We are talking about being eaten by worms. This is death and decay. After my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Who? I. Me. After my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, my skin destroyed, I will have flesh. In the future, that's resurrection. I shall see God. I will see him with my own eyes. And if we didn't get the continuity, and once again, is God bending over backwards here? I will see him with my own eyes. You'd think that would be enough. But then he says, in case you didn't get it, I am not another. That is a fundamental statement of continuity from this life to the next. For the trumpet will sound, 1 Corinthians 15 says, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. But the one who is changed, we are the ones who are changed. It will still be us, but changed. We are perishable now, we will be raised imperishable. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done well in the body, whether good or bad. So is the person who dies to go to be with the Lord the same person? Well, of course they've undergone change, but the whole point of the judgment seat and appearing and giving an account for our lives here is meaningless if it's not us, there is continuity between this life. The whole doctrine of eternal reward assumes continuity. The same person from this life goes into the next life. Yes, covered in the righteousness of Christ, as we already are, but we're, we will not just be sanctified. We'll ultimately be glorified, but it will really be us. If we endure, we will also reign with him, Second Timothy 2 says. Jesus said, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging or ruling the 12 tribes of Israel. So Jesus directly referred to the time when all things would be renewed here in Matthew 19. Peter, in the second sermon recorded in the book of Acts, says, ta- is talking about Jesus. He says, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things. Notice, again, it's all, it's comprehensive, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago, which, by the way, should be a clue to us. When we're reading the prophets, if we're not seeing a promise that God is going to restore all things, We're not reading them the way the Bible says we should, right? Because Peter saw it. Peter says it's right there about how God's going to restore all the things that have been, have fallen, all the things under the curse. Jesus says, I am making all things new in Revelation 21.5. So, are mountains, rivers, oceans, stars, planets, animals, culture, Arts, music, literature, sports, are they included in all things or was there like an asterisk? All things, asterisk, except most things. No. Primary discontinuity passage. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you, we're going to buzz through these in order to get to some other things before I run out of time, but look them up online at that link that I gave you, uh, and you can get the whole thing. But I'm going to move really uh, quickly to the point that you're not going to be able to follow it. 
through this. But I will go back to this one. Uh, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. This is used all the time. I talk with people all the time. Says, well, I mean, the, the Bible tells us we won't have a physical body. We'll have a spiritual body. Can I just emphasize the fact that spiritual is the adjective and body is the noun? That's important because the noun is the, th- is the thing. Spiritual is a description of it. To be a body, something must have physicality. It must have what a body has. Yeah, you can use body of Christ as an expression, figurative, or whatever, but that's not what he's talking about in this context very clearly. So, it is a body. It's physical. So, if I said I was going to give you a new car, which I'm not going to, just hypothetical. If I said I was going to give you a new car, would you say, oh, I'll bet that car won't have a steering wheel. It won't have tires. It won't have a transmission. Uh, it won't have a dashboard. It, it won't have a windshield. It won't have brakes. Uh, no, it's a car. It's a new car with better features. New body, better features, indestructible. I mean, that's not just better features. That's way better features. But the car will still be a car. The body will still be a body. The new earth will still be an earth, or it wouldn't be called an earth. I'm so tempted to go off on the ocean thing, but I'm going to say, if you don't read this in my heaven book, uh, I have a book called We Shall See God, where it's 60% Charles Spurgeon and 40% me. Uh, It's Charles Spurgeon on heaven, and that's 60% is by far the better part of the book. And so it's one of those easier to get forgiveness than permission that when I meet Charles Spurgeon, uh, you know, he may find out that we are co-authors of a book. And um, I didn't ask his permission, Uh, which I guess if I had one of those after-death experiences, I could, and then come back and say that. Anyway, so, um, all right, this idea of no time in heaven. totally false. Even in the present heaven, uh, the people of God cry out, how long, sovereign Lord, before you'll bring judgment on the inhabitants of the earth? And then the Lord tells them, they must wait a little longer. How long? Measurement of time. Wait a little longer? Measurement of time. Uh, They serve Him day and night in His temple, in the present heaven. Day and night. Measurement of time. How's this one? Revelation 8.1. There was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Okay, now, when I, I, I point this out to people, and I'll say, no, you're saying that there's timelessness in heaven. So music doesn't have a start, a middle, or an end. And quarter notes don't exist. And half notes don't exist. And what? Time. We are creatures. We live in time. Yes, but God is above and outside of time. Sure, but we're not God. We're still going to be creatures. We're still going to be finite. How about the new earth? Will there be time there? On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. So what's this based on? Revelation 10, 6 in the King James says, there should be time no longer. But in its context, first of all, it's, it's not a, a, it is not a good translation. I'm not talking about the King James as a whole. But in that passage, it's the ESV, the NIV, and the NLT all translated as there will be no more delay. And when those three versions agree, it must be right. Time will have run out. That's what it means. No time remaining before God brings judgment. The trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more. Yeah, but it's not in the Bible. I've had people quote that. Well, you know, like the Bible says, the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more. Well, the trumpet part's there, but not the time shall be no more. Do we forget this life when we die and go to heaven? And a lot of people take the Isaiah 65, 17 passage of the former things will be forgotten. They say, see, it proves that we won't remember anything. Well, once again, at the judgment seat, how do you give an account when you don't remember your life? Of, we'll have to have better memories in heaven, not worse memories. Or what about those martyrs who are crying out? How long before you judge and avenge our blood? They not only remember their life on earth, they remember being murdered for the gospel. Wow. And some people say, but we couldn't possibly remember things that happened on earth. 
because then it wouldn't be heaven for us. Well, God knows what goes on on earth. The angels know, and it's heaven for them. The key to heaven for us will be being in the presence of God and having his perspective, not having a memory wipe. The Bible does not teach that. What's the thing then about forgetting? Well, even in the context of Isaiah 65, there's a reference in the near context about sins and the past. And there, here's another one in Jeremiah 31, 34. I'll rem remember their sins no more. So the idea is things passing away. We will live happily ever after. We have not passed our peaks. We will not pass our peaks in this world. The Bible teaches resurrection. So when you have somebody like Nancy and I love Johnny Erickson Tata. She's a, she's a good friend, and Johnny will say all the time, I look forward to the day when I'll be able to walk and run through meadows and do all these things on the new earth. So she doesn't have to be a person who will be forever disappointed because she never knew what it was like or not since she was 17 and had that diving accident, to be able to walk and, and do these things. You have a loved one, like we have good friends where the wife is suffering from Alzheimer's, and it's just, it's, it's so hard, it's so difficult. But God will renew Debbie's mind. Debbie did not pass her peak. Debbie has not reached her peak. She will reach it in the resurrection, and she will never go past it. Forever redeemed in body and mind, no more sin. As Paul Helm says, not only will we not sin, not only will we not want to sin, we will not want to want to sin. It'll all be behind us. And that's why we don't need the bucket list. If there's a new Jerusalem, why would there not be a new Lake Victoria? And could there be a new Orlando? Not so sure about a new Disney. I don't know. It's possible. But, uh, but a new Orlando, a new Portland, a new Los Angeles, a new Rome, a new uh, Nairobi, uh, whatever. Why not? A, a, a new version of all the places that might be on a bucket list. Is a spiritual body non-physical? We've dealt with some of that. Uh, Christ's resurrection body is, is, is the key. They were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. Remember, we're told that we'll see Jesus and we're going to be like Jesus. Our resurrection body will be like his. So what was Jesus' resurrection body like? We don't have to speculate. We know. They thought they saw a spirit when Jesus appeared because how, what else could it be? He died. He can't be here in his body. And then Jesus said to him, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, it's really me. Touch, now listen to this. You've read it a hundred times or heard it preached. Let it sink in. What will our resurrection body be like, like his? Touch me and see. For a spirit, this is for all those who think spiritual body means non-physical, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. The inspired Word of God, the Son of God Himself, says that a resurrection body has flesh and bones. When He said this, He showed them His hands and His feet, and they saw the scars. That's the resurrection. The Westminster Confession, 1646. How many of you were around the… No. All the dead shall be raised up with the self-same bodies and none other, although with different qualities. The Westminster Larger Catechism the following year. The self-same bodies of the dead which were laid in the grave, make no mistake about it, being then again united to their souls forever, shall be raised up by the power of Christ. So if Christ's new body meant a body that hadn't existed before, then his old body would have stayed in the tomb. So, if a man named Bob goes to heaven when he dies, then Bob must be the old Bob made new 
or Bob doesn't really go to heaven. Now, this is not just for people named Bob. This is for everybody, right? Do you get the logic with that? We're talking about going to heaven. Well, if it's not us, then we didn't go to heaven, right? God made somebody else and maybe made him to look like us or maybe not. Maybe he gave him our name or probably not, but it's not really us. Well, then we didn't go to heaven. Scripture clearly says we'll not only go to heaven, but we'll be resurrected. Our bodies will be raised only if they remain our original bodies. So, now, I'm going to move quickly to something I want to stress here. Here we go. In uh, the remaining minutes that we have, five minutes, whatever it is. Time Magazine poll, this was back in 1997, I'm sure the same is probably true now. Of Americans who believe in a resurrection of the dead, two-thirds believe they will not have bodies after the resurrection. Now, if these are people who believe in a resurrection of the dead, they've probably been taught something in church or raised in a Christian home, at least a nominal one, maybe a very serious, authentic one. Two-thirds of those who believe in a resurrection of the dead believe they will not have bodies after the resurrection? We've got a problem of word meaning. Resurrection. You keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. Inigo Montoya, that great theologian who said this to… What was the guy's name? Vicini or whatever his name was. Wallace Shawn is the actor in The Princess Bride, because he keeps using the word inconceivable. It, this is, would be inconceivable that this man would still be following us, and this is inconceivable that he could climb up the side of this mountain. Well, he keeps doing these things that the guy says are inconceivable, and that's when he says, I do not think that word means what you think it means. And that's what's true of resurrection. I had a man in our church after I preached a message years ago. I haven't been a pastor since 1990, so this goes back. But this is when I was still a pastor, and I was talking about the, the new earth and the resurrection, having physical bodies, eating and drinking, which explicitly is referred to numbers of times that we will eat and drink in God's kingdom. In fact, Isaiah 26 says, the Lord himself shall prepare a feast for his people with the finest of meats, the best of wines. How great a feast will that be? God will be the chef, and we will enjoy these feasts. And Jesus says they'll come from the east and the west, and they'll sit down together in God's kingdom, and we will, we will feast together. How great will that be? What an incredible experience. But I'm talking about all this in the message, and this man looks at me afterwards and he says, are you meaning to tell me that we will have bodies and eat and drink? And then he said, it just sounds so unspiritual. Why? Because spiritual and physical were opposites in his mind. We have got to address that head on. You cannot understand Scripture and I'm going to end with these uh, next couple of slides. You cannot understand what Scripture is saying and have that viewpoint. So, notice the re in resurrection, resurrection, becoming embodied again after death, the same body made alive. Redemption, buying back what was formerly owned. Reconciliation, reconciliation, regaining a friend. Renewal, making new again, restoring to an original state. Regeneration, being born again, having a new beginning, and restoration, bringing back what was lost. So, we're going to finish right there. Thank you, and why don't we pray together just a moment. Father, there's so much in your Word, so much to be said in this area, but thank you for the promise that we as resurrected beings 
will be part of ruling over a new earth, a new universe, new heavens and new earth, that you will be king of kings and we will see your face and we will serve you and have things to do productively and that we will worship you as we see the new creation and all its richness and all its beauty. And until that day comes, Lord, help us to do what 2 Peter 3 says we are to do, to be looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwells. Empower us today and throughout the rest of our lives here to follow you wholeheartedly and to have that promise of a resurrected eternal life in your presence and with the people of God and help it to give us encouragement and hope in the darkest of times. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Let me take the flip side of that. From time to time, in fact, more frequently than you may realize, Mr. Graham will get letters from people that say something like this. You can't believe how bad a person I am. God couldn't forgive me. And it just ends up saying, I, I can't be saved. Uh, where does grace come into that? How would you reply to someone who said that? Well... All of us are uh, worse than we imagine. Um, and when a person comes to the conclusion that they are truly wicked, truly undeserving, uh, they have been enlightened by the Holy Spirit. I encourage people, I say, God is clearly at work in your life for you to even come to the realization of the depths of your sin. You've got the Apostle Paul, I'm the chief of all sinners. And isn't, isn't it remarkable that an arrogant, prideful murderer of Christians comes to faith in Christ through the divine intervention on the road to Damascus, and he becomes the primary spokesperson and the author of 13 or so letters in the New Testament. Hmm. Uh, do you think that that's just a coincidence? You know, suppose he had been just this righteous person all along in complete submission, immediately heard about Christ, submitted to him. You'd say, Paul, you just don't get it. You don't get what it means to be sinful and not deserve the grace of God. Oh, yeah, he gets it. He gets it big time, and he understands the grace of God, and, and we should too. There is no sin that is bigger than Jesus the Savior. 